to this week's edition of the community talk show. The community talk show is brought to you by Center for Constitutional Governance and Civic Space TV. I'm your moderator for today. My name is Lake Gender Fancy. I'm an advocate, I'm a tax consultant and a lecturer. Today's topic is the state of human rights in Uganda. This is a very, very pertinent topic and it's something that is very, very important. It is something that we have discussed over and over again. So today I have a panel of four who are going to help me unpack this topic. I'm going to let my panelists uh, introduce themselves. I'll start with my first panelist and that is Kranma. Kranma, you're welcome to introduce yourself. Thank you, Madam Nancy, Madam Fancy Gendaleka and my other fellow panelists. I'm Kranma Ahereza. I'm a, a humanitarian and uh, my humanitarian ec exercises are majorly done with Uganda Red Cross Society where I do volunteer on a, a daily basis where need be and on a part-time basis where conditions do determine so. And I'm glad to be part of you. Thank you so much, Kwanma, and we are happy to have you. Our second panelist is Adelaide Nachitende. Adelaide, I'll let you introduce yourself. Oh, thank you so much. Um, Adelaide Nachitende, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Oh, thank you. So Adelaide Nachitende is my name, a computer scientist. Uh, a youth leader in the Democratic Party, and I'm also an activist. I'm so passionate about human rights and uh, being a panelist here gives me an opportunity to share with the people that are conferencing with us here. Thank you, I'm glad. Thank you, and we are happy to have you. Our third panelist for today is Akun Lucy Okwera. Lucy, I'll let you introduce yourself. Um, thank you so much, Fancy. My name is Lucy Okwera Aku. I am an activist, I'm a feminist, uh, the vice national chairperson for Activista Uganda. Activista is um, the Young People's Network. It's a global young people network. Uh, that is uh, under the flagship of our uh, action aid. I am a Tuyajeshe fellow. Tuyajeshe is a Kiswahili word for empowering our sisters. Under the um, flagship of Akina Mama wa Africa, where we work with young women leaders to empower them uh, to become, uh, you know, decision makers in their different communities and influence change. Um, I am also an Umoja Peace Ambassador. I am a debater and I really love working with young people and seeing that uh, young people are creating change and moving things forward. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Lucy. We are happy to have you. Last but not least, we have um, Mr. Okot Pius, who is a human rights activist and coordinator activist in Gulu District. Uh, Pius will be joining us shortly, and when he joins us, uh, we'll be able to let him reintroduce himself. So as I stated earlier, our topic for today is state of human rights in Uganda. To introduce this topic, uh, the need to respect human rights can be traced as early as on the 10th of December 1948, when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted by the UN General Assembly. That was after uh, World War II. So uh, subsequently after that, uh, human rights revolution spread across the globe with signing of international and national commitments to protect human rights. Now, Uganda, which we are looking at today, uh, has ratified most of the international commitments. Let's talk about uh, the International Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights on 21st April of 1987, uh, Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman, or Degrading Treatment or Punishment uh, on 26th June 1987. And then there was also the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women on 21st of August 1985, and then International 
Covenant on Civil and Political Rights on 14th February 1996, among others, there are several other international instruments on protection of human rights that Uganda is a party to. Now, aside from that, um, we have our constitution where in uh, 1995, uh, constitution was promulgated and and prohibition of torture act of 2012. Among others, even the Uganda police force itself launched a human rights policy that aims at uh, promoting a democratic, accountable, and human rights sensitive policy in the county. But despite all these international laws and even the national laws, we have seen uh, human rights abuses in this country, especially during election period, we have seen during the COVID-19 pandemic, during the lockdown. Recently, we even saw in Kayunga what has been happening. So we have seen several human rights abuses. And this makes us come back to the drawing board and say, what is happening? This is something that we, we, we have advocated for years. This is something that we have put in the laws. So I'll, I'll let my panelists speak right from that introduction uh, that, that I have given to the topic. And I will I'll start uh, right away with Kranma uh, to pose my first question. Uh, my question uh -huh. to you is, uh, my question to you is, what is the current status of human rights in Uganda? Well, thank you, Madam Fancy. Of course, uh, the current status of human rights in Uganda can be defined by a lot not uh, what we can read, but what we can see with our own naked eyes. Right away from uh, events that have come happening, maybe let's say from the early 90s, but um, you know, there is uh, an increase in the violation of human rights generally. Uh, of later, I was trying to interact with someone who is a human rights activist, and he was like trying to tell me that uh, there is freedom of speech and then there is freedom after speech. The two comes in that uh, when we are speaking, we normally speak what we know, but after we, are spe after we have spoken, then there is that, we use that uh, freedom of speech to say out what we want wanted to say because it's what we knew. And then there comes uh, that time when you have to defend what you said like uh, he gave me a case of Lumbie. So Lumbie exercised his rights and the freedom of speech. But what came after he had uh, said what he wanted to say is that that is what he termed as freedom after speech. But all in all, I think at times when uh, we are trying to defend what we said, it is where those in power steps in to do the violation of human rights. And uh, what uh, I can also say, the current state of Uganda's human rights, it is a total violation of freedom of expression and assemblies. If I may give you some, uh, is some of the examples that have come happening, right? From, uh, I will start and keep on moving. If I'm to start on the, September 7th, 2020 event where the UCC issued the public notes requiring providers of online data and communication bloggers online and online TV providers to seek authorization from the, from the commission before they can uh, do any publications, they can do any hosts like this, they can uh, do anything. They had to first seek authorization from the authority. And on top of that, they had to pay 26.82 US dollars. That was 100,000 Uganda shillings. So that was something that came abruptly. It was not debated or upon, but the commission made a directive. I don't know if it is in the law or what, but to me, that is one of the violation of human rights. And again, if we can, uh, See on the July 24th, 2020 event, where the police arrested the Rizonto comedy group for a satirical video they posted online calling for people to pray for top government officials. 
maybe it's what they witnessed, but how it was uh, interpreted by the top government officials made the Bizonto to get in, uh, arrested. So uh, that is also a violation of uh, freedom of speech and assemblies. Now, we have uh, come, we have been seeing uh, plain crossed men coming in the guise of police and arresting citizens. This is not something that is usual. We normally know that the law, uh, the law is uh, clear. It provides that before one is arrested, the arresting officer should identify himself, him or herself, and the reason as to why he's arresting that uh, very person. But you'll be met along the way. You're kidnapped by plain crossed people who are armed and uh, they are saying they are police officers. We do not know where that law lies. And you do, no, no one will explain to you because you've not even been taken by the police. The police has even the right to deny that they are the fellow police officers who arrested you. So if we can come seeing all this, then uh, one will immediately know the state of the human rights that we are living in currently in our own country, Uganda. Again, we might look at uh, the 26th March 2020 event where the constitution, the constitutional court in Alfred section eight of the Public Order and Management Act, which has been used by the police block and restrict and disperse peaceful assemblies and demonstration by opposition and often with excessive force. All these things are happening uh, because we do not know who decides for this country. At times it uh, like it is an Afuge Gwangarino. But uh, we, have, we are seeing things happen. And uh, as citizens, we must wake up and we must talk because this is the state we are living in. The state, uh, like you asked briefly, if I'm to, stay, to tell you the state of human rights in Uganda, it is full of restricted access to internet. Like in, you can see how it happened during the elect uh, general elections. No one was supposed to use internet unless you are maybe someone uh, not like the usual cronimers. Some people will, would access the internet, but that was uh, those even that accessed it and they were initial citizens, those are where they use it to access, they, use, they accessed it illegally. We have seen the forced evictions. You just be on your land for more than eight years and then someone comes and claims your land and if you're forced to evict that land that belongs to you. We've seen unlawful killings, especially during the lockdown, that you're not supposed to cross this and this border. Instead of uh, stopping you oh, gently, some people lost their lives. They were shot and killed. So that is not uh, the state we want to see. We have a life to live. Our parents have the future to benefit from us. Our children and wives want us, the nation wants us. So if we can see all these unlawful killings, we don't uh, take everything as normal. It is something not normal. We have seen torture and other forms of ill treatments. Uh, last time the Segilinyas and, uh, and, and Muhammad Segilinya and Alan Sewanyana were in court, uh, near Alan, Alan Sewanyana, wanted to undress to show the public how he has been tortured. Segilinya rose her foot and we saw how he was tortured. And uh, again, he, has, he, he was not uh, granted bail to go and seek treatment outside the prison. So all this is uh, not what we would love to see as citizens of this country. We have seen excessive use of force by police, by people who, masquerade as police because if I'm playing close, I'm not uh, labeled, I'm not in a uniform, I do not have a name tag, no, no number to identify me as a police officer. There is nothing that uh, one will base on to call me a police officer, but yes, I'm armed and I'm a police officer and I would arrest you because you don't have the power to refuse. And those that have the power to refuse you from getting arrested, maybe are the ones that know who that person who's arresting you is. And so all these are just, we are looking at them. And uh, 
I don't know if we can change, but with these uh, engagements, I hope everything uh, will not remain the same. Again, Madam Fancy and fellow panelists, I have uh, we have seen the misuse of taxpayers' money, uh, which can be avoided. For example, on the 11th of June, 2020, when the High Court in Kampala ordered Makere University to pay damages worthy 120 million Uganda shillings to Stella Nyanzi for her wrongful dismissal from her research post in 2018. This was something that would have uh, been handled at a university level minus going to court, but because they wanted to show their power, you know, uh, this uh, Lord Acton said that power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. A statement that means a person's sense of morality lessens as his or her power increases. So if they were not power drunk, this is something they would have handled at a university level and in the show, and in the short run, I think we would not have uh, occurred this uh, expenditure. And this is not the only expenditure, it is just an example of the expenditures this country has faced as a result of excessive costs and excessive power and the people in power getting drunk of power. So this all, all is just a final, is causing financial losses to this country. And apparently it is not giving us a time to reckon about ourselves, to reckon on ourselves and then to make very good decisions because uh, when you settle to think, then something comes in and then it diverts your thinking. Why you'd have raced instead of going ahead, at times you're dragged behind. And all this, so like uh, illegal detentions, all this can be avoided. You cannot detain someone feeding on a taxpayer's money for 20 days, to 72 days, 40 days, even if, you know, mention them without uh, granting him a bail or taking him to court for a hearing. And all this is excessive financial expenses that the country is incurring. So apparently, and briefly, I can say, this is what is surrounding us as a, a open uh, way for my fellow panelists. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Cranma, uh, for, for giving us the current state of human rights in Uganda. Let me bring Adelaide into the discussion. So Adelaide, you have heard how worrying current state of human rights is in Uganda. What do you think is causing all this? Well, thank you, Fancy. You asked what is causing all this. But before I could answer what is causing all this, it is important for us to know and understand what human rights are. And then how do we get to the state we are in? In my own simple definition, human rights are entitlements that people are born with. These Human rights are not bought. They are not even given to us by the state. We don't earn them. We don't even inherit them. We are born with these human rights. How do we get there? How do we get to the state that Krenima has talked about? We have gotten to this state because the law is not protecting these human rights. And yet it is the obligation of our leaders and those who hold power and those especially in the justice sector to protect the law, the arm of the law must be seen in all this. But that means we have neglected the hand of the law. Usually they say that no one hides from the long arm of the law. But it is so absurd that here in Uganda, 
the arm of the law is indeed short. I can say it has become short. It is, it is not, it is not felt at all. Uh, when we get back as a country, we have signed several treaties, international and regional treaties. And in these treaties, we committed ourselves to protect the human rights. However, we are lagging back. We are not seeing these human rights being protected. But also, I want to say that our population is not well informed. We need more of these engagements and more public engagements to have our people get to know what these human rights are. A lot of times when you're ignorant, people who have information will take advantage of you. I'll take a case example of a suspect who is being arrested. At, at the time of arrest, the person who is arresting you, the arresting officer, should be in position to introduce themselves to you and give you a particular reason as to why you're being arrested. But we don't see this happening. And even when these people do not have information, the, the suspects being arrested do not have information, they will not have any way of defending themselves. So I want to particularly dwell on the fact that our population must equip themselves with information. It is the only way we can guard ourselves from violation of our rights. Uh, in this particular discussion, I want to talk about the right to culture, we have seen a lot of our people, I'll give a particular example of uh, the Bakonzo in, uh, in the Renzori region. For you to respect your culture and in any other setup, there is always a leadership. But we saw a few years back how the king of the Bakonzo, the, the Omosingawa Rezuru was uh, whisked away from his kingdom. The way he was whisked away was so degrading of his person, a high ranking person in that region. So at the end of the day, it gets us back to we need to know what these rights are. The moment we are equipped to information, then I'm quite sure we can see how to... Hello. Yes, Adelaide, you can proceed. we can see how best to get out of this situation. I'll also talk about, um, I'll talk about the right to economic rights. We have seen a lot of women at their workplaces being discontinued from work just because she had to go to maternity leave that wasn't granted the moment she walks away, then she has no job anymore. And because people don't know that maternity leave is a right for women, 
they silently walk away. So I will dwell so much on the fact that we need to equip ourselves with this information. We need to know our rights. We need to stand firm against all odds. Because we even have the right to access of information. But a lot of times we have seen this information being, being hidden, you know? So at the end of the day, I will still dwell on the fact that we as Ugandans need to equip ourselves with the rightful information. We must know what our rights are. We must know the conditions under which our rights are limited. Because there are also conditions under which your rights can be limited. So even when we, we pursue our human rights, we must know that we must know and be careful that we are not going out of way to have our own rights violated. For now, uh, that's what I can't say. We must equip ourselves with information. We must know our right. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Adelaide. I will pick right from where Adelaide stopped and I'll bring Lucy into the discussion. So Lucy, we have these very, very beautiful laws that Uganda has domestically, and we even have them internationally. My question to you is, does the community understand the laws that protect human rights? Uh, thank you so much, Fancy. I request not to turn on my video to uh, just avoid issues of network breakage. Uh, I'm not in a very stable place. So uh, back to your question. Thank you again for, uh, for that question. Uh, I, I work a lot with rural women particularly, and I must confess that uh, we have a very big problem with issues of uh, people in the rural community even having access to, to a constitution or having someone explain to them what is in the constitution, let alone the fact that most of them might not even know that Uganda as a, a nation has a constitution. So this, of course, trickles down a lot to uh, how much of the uh, violence violations they take because uh, some of them even take it, you know, this, this is something normal because they've seen it happen in their community for a long time. And as much as many civil society organizations, many individuals, uh, even some politicians have gone down to, uh, to, to sensitize their communities, yet it leaves still a very, very big gap. Uh, as we know, Article 24 of the Constitution of Uganda prohibits any form of, you know, uh, torture, cruel, inhuman, degrading treatment or punishment. Uh, against people mostly when they're taken to court. But uh, I have witnessed on several occasions, people go through this and then they, they just take it. They don't even say anything to it. They don't report it because they don't know otherwise. They don't know that that is wrong. So uh, again, fancy, there is a very, very big gap uh, in the issue uh, what we're, regarding issues of knowledge of uh, these laws that we have uh, that are very, very beautifully on paper. Uh, that although the implementation is, uh, is not there or it's limited. So I, I, I think if the implementation of these laws were there, uh, maybe to some extent the people would know that uh, this is what our constitution says and this is what we should do. But um, again, there is really very, very limited knowledge on uh, the laws that we have that governs issues around human rights. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you so much, Lucy. Uh, getting back to Pranma. So let's, let's talk about the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, to what extent did the pandemic contribute to the abuse of human rights in the country? Come again, Madam Pansi. Um, to what extent has the COVID pandemic um, contributed uh, to the human rights abuses in the county. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again, Madam Fancy. This is something amazing, but uh, we must uh, accept 
to the fact that uh, we have people who belong to this country and we have people who belong to this country. I guess one will differentiate the statement even when it is the same, depending on how we are living in the same country, we are the same citizens of this country, but we are not treated the same. We have people like actually this uh, COVID pandemic has defined who the true citizens of this country are. For example, you're here that uh, vehicles, we are restricted from moving across borders. Private vehicles, we are not supposed to be driven, not even away from your compound. We have seen like uh, people, we are not supposed to maybe um, uh, food markets were only places that uh, were supposed to be opened. And at a certain stage, restaurants were also ordered to close. You have, you be mindful that we have people who we are say, staying in Barara or Kampala, but uh, had not to, had not clear means of uh, getting food by themselves because they may, were maybe border border riders and they could only access support for their families and their own lives by the virtue of what they uh, were doing because it's what could feed them. Now, uh, the fountain of honor, who's uh, the president of this country, comes and makes an order that border borders, you're not supposed to be working for the next 32 days. You are not supposed uh, to move away, away from uh, your area of residence for the next 32 days. And now, this is the person who has nothing to feed on. Even when he's allowed to move, maybe to go and look for the food to eat, the restaurant is closed. He has nowhere to eat. Some of those guys do not know how to cook and that was not something that was considered. And the only job they could feed on was the border border riding. And that was blocked also. It was not supposed to function. You find that that person was a breadwinner of the family, the family which he stays not with. And uh, you now think about that family, which is happening in a country. They, he could uh, maybe be sending assistance of say 20,000 per week, but that family is starving and the person who used to provide is also as well starving. Now comes in the political sector. Our politicians tried to give assistance in a way of uh, providing relief aid in the terms of food, maybe soap and all that. And then the government blocks them. You're not supposed to give any aid if you're not going through the government. But the government has also that bureaucracy. Someone who's starving today and I have bought posho for him and you expect me to go and register it with the government or district authorities with a task for the designated task force. And then it takes like a week. Where do you expect to find that person? On top of that, the people that we are selected to be on that task force, we are majorly part of the ruling government. The opposition, we are the very first people to respond even before the government realized that people needed assistance. Those very people were arrested. The case was on Zaki. I think he was the first person to be arrested because of giving relief food items to the COVID isolated people in uh, their families because we are all order isolated. We are also ordered to isolate. And now, after he was arrested, it was when the government picked a leaf that yes, what maybe he was doing, even when we arrested him, was right. So let us also give assistance and order them that if you want to give an assistance in, in, uh, in the guise of uh, giving relief items to these people, then pass it through the designated task force. But that was bureaucracy. If someone, there is a, what we call emergency, 
emergency must be attended to as an emergency. It's, it, it's not just uh, calling it urgent is not enough. It is an emergency. So if you take someone for, and you don't respond to that person who is in emergency for more than a minute, then you will not find that. So you will find that uh, people, some were allowed to move, even when their positions could not allow them to move because they are citizens uh, away from citizens, because they were saying, the authority now remains with the RDC and the RCCs to know who's supposed to move from place to place and why. So uh, those that had made their monies would corrupt those RDCs, and I'm sure about this, would corrupt the RDCs and to go get a letter and they would move, even when they were not supposed to move because they were only mere citizens. For example, someone would say, ah, you know, I'm a, a resident of Ushenyi and my family is in Kampala and it is starving, but you know, get this 200, let me go with my car and I will do what? Rescue my family. But the order was clear, let everyone stay where he is for the next 32 days. So Madam Fancy, this is what we are going through. We are. We have been divided in two categories where we have citizens and citizens. We have come seeing all this happen and uh, I don't know where the law is, but apparently it uh, will just soon uh, get understand, uh, understood to every one of us. We have seen a violation of so many chapters and articles of the Constitution, a uh, case is Article 50, uh, Chapter 4 of the Constitution, which talks ma mainly about enforcement of rights and freedom by courts. So we were under this chapter, on, uh, under Chapter 4, Article 27 is clear on the rights to privacy of a person's home and other property, but we've seen People were evicted from their homes. People were unlawfully searched. They have, uh, and their property and their homes were unlawfully searched. We've seen people's homes unlawfully being entered into by other people, even when they don't have to identify themselves because they are citizens away from citizens. We have seen people being interfered with. It could be their communication. You're not supposed to say this. Even when you're saying this, I do not know the, uh, the interpretation that will come after this communication I'm making. So we find all this has come because the country is, uh, I don't know, the laws of this country have just been stripped naked. So apparently the COVID-19 has not been a favorable talk of the private institutions. We have seen teachers get salaries when they are even not staying at school. Those are government teachers. But private teachers are not even thought about. These are the people who were getting little, or possibly nothing. Others are paid depending on the hours they work. If you miss a lesson, then you'll not be paid. Or well, that lesson may be an you 3,000 and you miss that 3,000. And now that you're teaching nothing like a lesson, you're getting nothing like a pay. And all this is what, got, because these private institutions at the end of the year earn to our annual income as a country. So the government is not thinking about them. And I think they are, they are freedom and right to live peacefully and happily in their own country is being violated at the end of the day. You know, we've seen uh, say the government came up and said, now let, uh, let the healthy centers keep functioning, but those who are sick are not supposed to move from their homes. And the ambulance drivers would also use the ambulances to drive their own cargo. So all this has exposed the government and uh, maybe COVID-19 also Added, uh, made a contribution to what the government needs to improve on. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Cranba. Um, let me move to Adelaide. 
So Adelaide, to, to what extent are state institutions uh, such as police being used to abuse uh, human rights in this country? Um, thank you. To what extent are state institutions being used to violate human rights? Well, good question. But pondering on the community and the, the kind of population we have, uh, being that Ugandans are not, are not well equipped with information on human rights, police and other institutions of the state will find leeway in violating the human rights. And we have seen this happening. We have seen the police violating the human rights. Take an example of the way they conduct the arrests. Like my, my colleague Kranma had talked before, he talked about police officers coming to a would-be suspect they will not introduce him. They, they will not introduce themselves. They will not even give their reason for the arrest, and people are just whisked away. It is not fair. And indeed, this is on the rise, which shows that these state institutions are indeed part, they play a big role in violating these human rights. And at the end of the day, who, who we would like to know who are those that are using the state institutions and why must the state institutions not be independent? Because we have police, high ranking officers who should be calling their subordinates to order, but we don't see this happening. Instead, we would see an Enanga, sorry to say, coming up to defend these actions. The situation has become a man eat man. Survival for the fittest is the order of the day in that the police that should be protecting people, the police that should be keeping law and order are seeing themselves breaking the law and violating the human rights. Well, on the other hand, they are also keen enough to use Hello? Adelaide, we can hear you. I'm saying these police officers always look for a way to get away with it. We have not seen police officers who are violating human rights being brought to order. We have not been, we have not seen them being cautioned. That is where we need the state to come in. That is where we need 
the high ranking officers in these institutions to come in and bring these people to order. We have seen in the cases of uh, MP Tsegirinya and uh, Sewanyana, they were whisked away like chicken thieves. These are a high ranking people in this country. But if they can be whisked away, what, what example is it giving to the public? If these high ranking officers can be whisked away in such a manner, then what will an ordinary Ugandan do? How will they be treated? You know, at the end of the day, the state institutions are being used by people who think they have gotten a grip on the power in this country. But one thing we must assure them is as day follows night, Ugandans and Uganda as a country has signed to protect, has signed several treaties to protect the human rights, both international treaties and regional treaties. We have the Penal Code Act. We have, we also have, uh, we have the constitution, the 1995 constitution that, that correctly highlights the human rights. We would really call these state institutions and those people using power the wrong way to be called to order, let them behave. Uganda is here to stay and leadership can always change. But at the end of the day, we must learn to harmonize. We must learn to live in peace. We must learn to protect each other. We must learn to protect the human rights. These institutions have the obligation to protect these human rights. The law in Uganda is in deep slumber over human rights. But we must say we, we, we are calling out on all of them, the institution heads, the people in, 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 in the justice sector, that they must be restored to sanity. They must be restored to sanity and these human rights must be upheld. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Adelaide. Now, moving to, to Lucy. So Lucy, we have seen efforts from CSOs, from the citizens, from different political parties, especially the ones in opposition, advocating for protection of human rights in this country. But still, we still see these abuses at a very high level. Do you think it's time to change our approach uh, in advocating for protection of human rights? Okay, I, I can see Lucy. Uh, sorry, Fancy, I, well, I didn't get the question well. You were paused at some point. Oh, okay. Yeah, my, yeah. my, okay, let me repeat. My question to you is that um, we, we have seen uh, different actors advocate for human rights. We have seen CSOs, the citizens themselves, political parties advocating for human rights. But at the end of the day, the abuses are on the rise. So do you think it's time to change our approach 
uh, when advocating for this right? Uh, okay, uh, thank you so much. I, I think uh, one, what, what, what the CSOs and other actors just need to do right now because uh, as, as an activist uh, oftentimes you know we go and have issues of uh, how these policies that we have in place are implemented how certain things are going on but then uh, it ends there so I think we need to to on addition to what we are already doing we need to take it a step further we need to take uh, put in some actions uh, personally I think the Human Rights Commission should make should make use of its powers to regularly inspect some of these uh, institutions that are, that are in charge of the, uh, you know, issues surrounding uh, human rights, uh, like the police and how they handle some of the cases, how they handle, you know, people who are being uh, detained for very long and are not taken to court, people who are tortured. We have seen this with several political leaders. Uh, Zake, as uh, Kranma mentioned at some point, uh, went through this. So I think uh, one, we should add on what we are already doing. Uh, uh, and I would suggest that uh, uh, besides doing the advocacy and the activism, we should also take into actions. Uh, for example, if we, we, we see that uh, there is any human rights violation taking place, I can give a case in point uh, for the, the legal, the, the, the human rights uh, defender or appeal, Mr. Opio, if you remember, uh, back in 2020, he was uh, arrested, detained, his office was, you know, checked, it's home, you know, a lot of these organizations. I think in such cases, uh, human rights advocates need to take action and needs to, you know, move forward to go and call to action some of these institutions that in the, like put, put our citizens through such things and uh, call for change. Uh, so what I'm saying is that, yes, what we are doing is, is, is good, but it's not enough. We need to do more and we need to continue uh, speaking up. We shouldn't, we shouldn't shy away because they are torturing us. We are having all these things happening. I remember in April 2019, uh, UCC directed about uh, 30 radio stations and TV television stations to suspend that stuff just because they were hearing programs that uh, they, they were claiming were biased and balanced and sensational. So you see things like that. But nevertheless, uh, most of these radio stations didn't just stop them. They continued, you know, putting out the information of these stations being known. Then uh, I think That's when also other people can come no seen and keep being quiet. Uh, thank you, Fancy. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Lucy. Uh, moving to Cranma. Uh, Cranma, my, my question to you is, can we trust our judicial system, the court system, to, to, to handle human rights abuses? Thank you, Madam Fancy. I think... Uh... Whenever I read about our country motto, I think all hope is not lost yet. It is still possible that uh, these courts can do better if and only if they are given full powers to do what they are supposed to do, when they are supposed to do it, and where they're supposed to be from. If they are not uh, all the time monitored intimidated and threatened, these lawyers are qualified lawyers. If they can be paid very well, because uh, the report says that at a certain point they are the most corrupt sect of the government, uh, we hope they can handle and do, and they can handle all this well, because this is not a big deal. If uh, we can, uh, see the cases that are logging in court there's that are still unattended too you not see a, a, a case that is not that is so big not to be handled so but the biggest problem lies in what to be handled first and who is directing on what should be handled first they are our courts are not given full powers 
to do what they are supposed to do when they are supposed to do it. And in any case, actually they are directed on how to do it. Because if I may say there was uh, the other time uh, we saw the other lady, the court of appeal who came with the files and from nowhere, uh, the court was uh, called to a break and her files were taken away from her. So that means what she wanted to present because uh, she had an independent mind, she's supposed to say what uh, her findings came as, uh, that's what she was supposed to present, but she was not given that case. And they were saying, Owinidoro was saying that uh, as a court, they had to agree on what to present, but everyone made her, uh, his or her own findings. And that's what the findings were to be combined before the people they were to be presented and the final decision would be reached, not deciding before you see it. It's like making an accountability of the budget before you spend. The money is not yet in your docket, but you've already budgeted for it and you've already accounted for it. So that is what uh, I'm trying to mean. So if they can be given full powers to act as them and according to how the Lord directs them to act, I think they can act. I trust these courts and uh, a few of these uh, court officials can do it very, quite very well, actually. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kranma. Uh, moving to Adelaide. Um, uh, Adelaide, how do we hold government for human rights abuses that we have been seeing coming from state institutions? We, as, as earlier in, in, in your discussion and also from the different panelists, we have seen human rights abuses come right from the state itself. So how do we hold the state accountable for the human rights abuses that have been uh, done? Well, thank you so much, Fancy. How we hold the state accountable is a collective responsibility. We have got to up our game on this. We have got to reorganize ourselves because it is our sole responsibility even before we think the state should protect us we have our own individual responsibility to protect ourselves even before the state can protect us. As I said, it has become a man eat man. But in such a situation, we need to reorganize as citizens of this country. We need to fall back and know that it is collective responsibility. We need to speak up to the authorities. We need to speak up to these institutions that are violating human rights. We need to reorganize ourselves, mobilize ourselves, because there is power in mobilization. There is power in standing together and believing together. There is power in knowing that if the state cannot protect us, we need to get up and protect ourselves. It is my call upon civil society here in Uganda. It is my call upon every Ugandan because you may say, ah, oh, no, after all, you know, they, these are politicians 
we chanting each other. But at the end of the day, how would you explain an old woman who has right to property and their property has been taken away from them, has been grabbed from them in the presence of the police, in the presence of the army, that people who are supposed to protect and defend the country and protect the Ugandans and their property are the same people who stand there to see these, these rights being violated. They even go an extra mile to indulge themselves in violating these rights. I also want to, to think it's never too late. These state institutions can still rethink their actions. Because at the end of the day, the police officers, the army officers are Ugandans before they become police officers, before they become army officers. So consider a situation where, say, a, a, a parent or an old mother to a police officer's land is being grabbed by a senior police officer or senior army officer. So we need to rethink, reorganize, reconcile these things that seem to have gone out of the way. I still believe and I'm positive that it's never too late for Ugandans to stand up and defend themselves against these people who think they are drunken on power and they will do just about anything, including violating the human rights. These rights we are born with. We are not going to plead for the state to give us these human rights. No, we are born with these rights and we need to collectively stand up against this behavior. I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Adelaide, for that. Uh, moving to Lucy. Lucy, what are some of the challenges you as an activist has faced advocating for human rights in this country? I guess, uh, let me move to Kranma then. Um, um, Lucy is not responding. So, um, Kranma, uh, moving to you. Okay. okay. Sorry, Lucy. sorry, Fancy. My, my network had cut me short. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, uh, my, can my, my question, okay. My question to you is what are the challenges um, that you have gone through as an, advo uh, as an activist uh, advocating for human rights? Uh, wow, that is a very deep question. So, yes, there are actually a number of challenges, uh, I would say. Uh, for one, uh, then uh, to confront let, uh, the, the institutions like we, 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 we had a, 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 a online campaign against uh, the, the, the number of, of people that are carried in a, in a vehicle during the SOP restrictions. You know, they would have charges double price, like from Gulu to Kampala, 50,000. And yet they still carry full capacity. So we had we had a campaign against that. We had to go to the police. We had to go, you know, to these different uh, actors who are who are and, and the low low policy make like policy implementers. And the police was trying, you know, to to blast us off, threatening uh, to arrest us because they feel like okay, for one, we are just trying to to, to use such stories to to lobby for funding. That's what they believe that we just want money from the donors, we are, we are sharing these stories, we are using uh, people's photos without their consent. You know, a lot of allegations, 
So for one, I, I have not been practically arrested, but I've been threatened to be arrested because of speaking up, because of advocating, because of, you know, really uh, not in that space. is where they can voice their issues and it's hard. So I have been threatened to be arrested. Uh, we have been detained somewhere for a very long time. We had gone, this was in the Palan issues. I, I, you could have heard of it. We had gone just to find out from the community members what was happening. The homies that were there detained us for quite a long time without water, without food. And um, we, of course, we left, but very late in the night after going through a lot. Uh, there are also issues of threatening your life because uh, we, we had a case of a young girl of about five years who was defiled. So the, the, the family didn't have uh, enough money to, to you know, follow up issues on, in court. So uh, we took up the case as we were following up. The other family of the person, of the perpetrator, wanted, you know, to do away with us because to, to them we are blocking that, uh, you know, there are some from coming out of prison. So we have, we have been through, you know, I've faced a number of challenges you're going to. Uh, most people don't see you for what you're really doing. They think you, you're you just doing it for other, other reasons. And yet, uh, and if you, you, you're stepping on the toes of someone because they are in the wrong and you're pointing it out, they don't want that to be out, then, you know, you, you, we are threatened a lot. So I've mostly encountered issues around security and uh, things like that. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, moving to, to Kranma, um, looking at other countries outside uh, Uganda, uh, when you compare with Uganda, how are we doing in terms of uh, human rights protection? Well, 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 well. Uh, thank you once again, Madam Fancy. But uh, you know, I would wish us to limit this question to the people so that everyone can understand this because most of the people that are watching us have not uh, been uh, beyond the borders of this country. But uh, we we'll maybe uh, I'll answer this basing on what we. Is it just me or, or all of you? I, I can't hear Kranma. It's it's like he paused. Adelaide, are you able to hear Kranma? Uh, I can't hear Kranma too. I, I think his network is a bit poor. I also can't hear him. Uh, okay. Okay then. Um as as we as we wait for Okay, as you wait for him to come back and uh, proceed on that point, let me move to Adelaide then. So Adelaide, uh, my question to you is that uh, we have seen reluctance on the side of government to investigate, uh, prosecute and punish officials who have committed human rights violations, whether it being they are security uh, services or like security officials. Uh, what is your take on that? Please help me repeat the question. Okay, my my question to I can see uh Kranma is back, which I'll have him right after you. Um Kranma, you can hold on right after the night. You'll be able to come back and proceed with the same point you were making. So Adelaide, my question to you is uh we have seen reluctance on the side of government to investigate and prosecute uh, security officials who have uh, violated human rights in this country. What is your take on that? Well, thank you for that question. Uh, I personally must confess that true, there is reluctancy of the state to check human rights violations by these institutions, state institutions. Uh, 
Oh, really? I do not want to basically call it for lack of a better word, I don't want, I don't even want to call it incompetence, but I think it is a whole cocktail of incompetence, re reluctance, drunkenness on power, and uh, the guts to find no value in human rights because a lot of times they do these things because they are protecting their own selfish interests. Um, I'll still think amidst all this, they still have a chance. I'm a person who believes in second chance because at the end of the day, before, before this government came to power, these violations were here. These violations of human rights were here long before this government came to power. And for some reason, they claim it was the reason they went to the bush a lot of those Golira war leaders claim they went to the bush because of partly human rights violations. And it beats my understanding how the very reason they went to the bush is the very reason People are not comfortable today. It cannot be changed from human rights violation to human rights violation. More of human rights violation, no. They should be up to the task to prove that they are in control of these institutions. It goes back to them that they need to check these institutions. If the heads of these institutions are incompetent, they should be replaced. We need to see better and if they cannot replace them, then that is provocative of the public to stand up and defend ourselves. So before we can think we should stand up and defend ourselves, I think they have an obligation to call themselves to order and not to stick to the fact that it was a mere change of guards. I beg to submit. Okay, uh, thank you, Adelaide. Uh, let us have uh, Kranma back on board. Uh, Kranma, you were comparing Uganda with other countries in terms of protection of human rights. Thank you very much. Uh, I had started on saying that uh, the best way to talk about this is uh, to limit it to the borders of this country in a way that uh, most of the citizens of Uganda have not moved out of the country, have not crossed the borders of this country to visit the other countries. But uh, still, we may tackle it in an angle that we shall focus on what we've seen on the internet, in the news, and what we have read in the media. 
So generally, I would say that uh, for the last 20 years, Uganda has uh, tried to test some peace, uh, some peace uh, after the dead rebellion that took place in the northern region of the country. But still, there is some, uh, we are still seeing spots of political violence with the uh, security forces accused of uh, cracking down the opposition activities. So when we try to compare this, I think uh, as the Ugandans, we are not living in peace as we should be because even when we are peaceful, we can be peaceful beyond this level. Uh, like I told you earlier, the struggles we are going through can be avoided. For example, why would uh, a plain closed officer come to arrest me and does not even allow me to submit my defense or to ask him any question uh, before I'm whisked into the drone and driven away. So all this can be avoided. And that's why I'm saying we are, I'm not saying we are poorly, uh, not peaceful at all, but we can do better than this. And again, uh, the, the officers, those that are drunk with power, can polish. The other time I saw the retired police officer, Samuel Mara, crying fall on MBS TV that he did what he was more, what uh, he did more than what he was supposed to do while he was in the forces, especially when he was uh, the guard of the uh, NOPE leader, Bobby Wine. And uh, he was there for close to a month and he was forced to. Uh, some of opposition leaders wanted to bribe him with 200 million, but he refused that bribe. And he reported to his boss, the then IGP, uh, Kale Kaihura. And uh, Omala, in doing so, wanted uh, Kaihura to take him to President Museveni and tell the Fountain of Honor what he has gone through so that maybe he could earn a favor. So he was crying for that uh, the government has not paid him for all that service because he worked for, he worked more than what he was required of. Now, this is a, a scenario that opens our eyes and will show us that, yes, they are in forces, but they do not mind about life out of that uniform. And uh, as Ugandans, uh, this is an eye opener, and maybe a whistleblower, we need to see beyond that. And if those police officers can learn from the, some of my experience, they, and they do what they are supposed to do when they are supposed to do it and how they are supposed to do it. So it is enough that uh, this country is peaceful if the people in power can exercise their power according to the laws and they do not uh, strike our constitutional laws naked. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Kranma. Moving to Lucy. Lucy, let's talk about women rights uh, specifically. Uh, Fancy, can I first add something to, to Kranma's question, then you ask me? Yes, yes, please do. Okay, um, thank you so much. Actually, I was in Arusha, and uh, honestly, I was very, very surprised at how the police carry themselves. Uh, Uh, there, because you know, different towns and uh, places in Arusha. Uh, uh, we, 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 you know, we uh, fancy. Hello, yes, Lucy, you're, you're breaking, but we can still hear you. You can, can you? you can go ahead. Okay. Okay. So I. I, I was just a uh, uh, in 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 in, our, in Tanzania. Uh, you know, I never saw any policeman holding any gun. The police was very friendly. They were asking, you know, they ask you questions. Can you please come out of the van? Asking you questions politely and. And uh, things like, you know, the small, small levels of, of, of 
hospitality there. I was actually surprised because I'm used to our police. When they stop you, there is something up you have, you know. This is how the police are used. This is what some members already know, which was completely a different case. Uh, we had one of us who didn't have the travel documents with them. And uh, you know, the police talked to them and told them, you know, this is very important. Next time, please do carry it. We are going to excuse you. So, you know, having that, that friendly conversations and even uh, encounter really shook me because if that was to happen in, in, in a police checkpoint in Uganda, you were going to part with a lot of money. You know, so I think uh, the, uh, the different issues, I think uh, maybe because of the mindset or how things have been done for quite some time here at home with our forces, the police, the army, we find that they are, they are used to doing things. Uh, aggressively as the scenario. Uh, maybe we can now go ahead to my question. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, Lucy, for that addition. Now, uh, we, we are moving to women's rights. Um, what is the current state of women's rights in this country? Uh, I think uh, I'm going to talk particularly for the area that I've have been able to work for for quite a long time uh, on issues of women's rights. That is northern part of Uganda, uh, particularly Pade, Agabo, and Gulu districts. Um, of the, there are several issues of women's uh, rights violations. For one, I need to start uh, by pointing out the issues on uh, women land ownership, where we know that uh, there has been issues around this. Uh, as you also may know, women are mostly the breadwinners of the home. They are the ones that make sure the children have eaten and things like that, but they don't have access or even ownership uh, most times to land uh, for production. And uh, this has really affected them. You find that uh, a woman cannot even be able to take care of the children, cannot dig and feed because now the land is owned by the man and maybe the man is using it for something else. Uh, that aside, there's also the issues of uh, during the, the lockdown, we, there was a rise in issues of uh, prostitution and uh, defilement and rape. Now this is on the uh, Ingulu in particular. I, 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 I currently I work with an organization that works and rehabilitates uh, street connected children. And uh, you find that these young girls are really having it rough on the streets. Uh, the other time uh, a girl was sharing with me her story where, you know, she's like, when they locked down, all their businesses died. They used to sell chips along the roadside and things like that. There, there were like about six girls, their businesses collapsed. They had to start staying at home. They didn't have any means. And uh, then uh, one time, you know, some like these armies would do patrol. They got them when they were just standing in a group. They thought they were thieves. They took them in. No one was there to bail them. They stayed like for small most remand when they tried to ask to explain themselves they were not even given find that in such cases now it's hard it's hard it's really hard because there's even no one to to come to their rescue and they don't have much to do so i think uh this of course uh coming from the issues of the effects of COVID-19 and how our institutions again and uh, the forces are handling it. Um, very many women and young girls are really, really uh, suffering, mostly around issues of uh, uh, rape and defilement and now joining prostitution. Issues of child marriage has come to arise, but they in particular just in a month, within the period of three months, uh, uh, I was told, the CDO told me, the, the, the CDO of the district told me that they registered 930 teenage pregnancies and child marriages, which was really, really, really high. So uh, I, I think the issues around women's rights, which was really there. Okay, thank you uh, so much, uh, Lucy. Um, moving to Adelaide. So Adelaide, how do we ensure protection of women's rights in this country? 
for us to ensure protection of women rights, to start with, these women must be we call responsible Ugandans, move around, educate these women, help them get to know what their rights are, because it all starts from having the knowledge, as I said earlier. The moment you have the knowledge, you have this information, you know your rights, then you know how to defend them. Uh, secondly, the the the, ju the justice sector must wake up. It cannot be that we have three arms of government and the executive is actively drunken on power. The legislature is being raped by the executive and uh, the justice sector is looking on. <laughs> it cannot be fair. It feels like the justice is not a part of this country. They cannot look on while the executive is raping the legislature. While everything is, is going to the dogs, I think my call would still go to the justice sector that they must wake up. They have a responsibility, they have an obligation to this country. So they must act professionally while doing their work. We cannot keep sleeping and seeing them close their eyes on all this that is transpiring. They cannot be deaf on all, on all this that is happening. They need to wake up before they even think about running to the executive to have their, their salaries increased. They were, no one called them to, to, to be professionals in that sector of justice. So it should be from within them that they must learn to fight and fight for the rights, for the human rights of Ugandans because they carry that obligation upon them. Um, I also think the women the women could probably think of getting together and fight for their rights. If the justice forum cannot fight for them, if everyone else is deaf about these human rights, the women are the mothers of this country. By the, by the, by the mere role that they bring life. They cannot sit back and see this country go to the dogs. I would think, like we the Baganda say, we can work together as women, remobilize ourselves because 
together we stand against all these injustices. But the moment we close our eyes on this, mean uh, man eat man. So it is our sole responsibility as women, we can reorganize, we can remobilize ourselves and stand against all these injustices and stand against the violation of women right thank you okay thank you so much Adelaide. so we are now entering into the stage of our talk show where we provide solutions to the problems that we cited so i'll start right away with Kranma. what do you think should be done in this country to ensure protection of human rights Thank you very much, our moderator. But uh, the steps to take are within us, and they are with us, and they are for us. So, for example, we need to educate. We must engage, we must empower, we must believe and trust, and we must advocate. Everyone uh, has a right to know his freedoms the freedom of speech, the freedom and right to health care, the freedom and right to education, the freedom and right to expression, and all that. So uh, the only way, the way is that uh, we should not assume that we have special custodians of those human rights. Let us advocate right from top to the bottom. Let us empower, let us identify the people to empower and let them educate the masses. Let us use the available platforms to advocate for these human rights. Let everyone know what belongs to him. And let us know that uh, at a one point, we all deserve better. So if we can engage everyone, if we can empower everyone, and if we can believe and trust that everyone can do the advocacy, then the message will be easy to go to the masses and easily they will absorb. So briefly, we need to have our constitution exposed to the public. We need the public to go to go learn and get equipped with the tips on the constitution, their human rights, their rights and freedoms, and they need to learn for it. Secondly, we need have to use the available platforms. We must engage our leaders. For example, you'll find that uh, most of these MPs that we do have present what they, what they feel they will benefit from. But if we can engage them as, uh, as the electorates, we call our MPs, we tell them, for example, we need this and this past. If it is to make a budget for it, let it be made. And let us know that this budget is uh, directed or shooting to educating the masses on their human rights. Uh, and again, we can use our civil societies. Yes, somewhere are closed but uh, all hope is not lost yet and uh, they are not closed. Let us use the still available space to educate the masses. The whole thing rotates around uh, educating the masses, empowering and engaging every citizen to see that uh, everyone knows their, their rights. And in so doing, you'll find that uh, we are no longer cowards, but we believe in our own selves. When a plain clothes officer comes to arrest me, whereas I'm in the midst of the mass of people, I'm with my other fellows, instead of them running away and I'm taken, they will defend me because it's their right. When they get to know that, everything will move smoothly. And I think we shall have very few or not any cases of uh, human rights violence. Thank you. Okay, then uh, let's move to 
to Adelaide. So Adelaide, we have heard from Cranma, his, uh, what he proposes should be done to uh, ensure human rights protection in this country. We would like to hear from you as well, your opinion. What do you think should be done to ensure protection of human rights in this country? Thank you, Fancy. Now, for us to ensure protection of human rights, we have got to stand up against all these violations. We have got to stand up against all these intimidations. We have got most importantly to educate our people, our population about the human rights, what they are, and how to defend themselves, to have their rights not violated. It is very important to have this information. We also have got to stand up against discrimination. Like I said earlier, it is a collective responsibility. So if it's a collective responsibility, we have got to stand together. Stand together, unite against these violations of human rights. We have got to invoke or rather provoke the justice sector. Wake them up from slumber. We have got to talk about these things. If we never talk about them, one by one, our rights will be violated. And before we know it, the entire country is, is sick from human rights violation. So we need to stand up. We need to know our rights. We need to provoke the people that hold the power of the law those that are supposed to exercise the power of the law, they need to be reminded all the time. A lot of times when they get into, into these positions, they go and sleep, no. We need to wake them up by speaking to them openly. We also need to remind these state institutions that most importantly, the people in these state institutions are Ugandans before they work for these institutions. So it is important that when a Ugandan is protected, another Ugandan is protected because we do not want to get desperate to get to a point where everyone is desperate and they choose their own ways of resolving these violations. We also need to rethink about the quality of leaders we choose. A lot of times if the leaders are not well informed, it is hard to bring them to order. 
So the quality of legislature, the quality of the justice sector, the quality of the executive is a sole responsibility of every individual Ugandan. I will keep re echo that people must seek to know their rights and have them at their fingertips so that they are not violated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adelaide, for, for, for that. Um, let's hear from Lucy. So, so Lucy, uh, what, what do you think should be done to ensure protection of human rights in this country? Um, thank you, Fancy. Uh, I think uh, I'll start with one. We should, as individuals, as uh, citizens, also take responsibilities into taking, uh, you know, these issues. In like uh, Tanma mentioned, speak up, say something, uh, do something about it. Just uh, don't just look by have a, or someone is people around in a way. Um, and also, secondly, I think. Um, the issues of around arresting and detaining people for a long time and also taking them to uh, detention areas where which are not known to the public is not right. So in that case, I think uh, suspects should be held in publicly recognized places of detention and accurate information about their arrest and detention should be made available to their families or court or the lawyers without delays. In that way, uh, the person will be heard of course in the court of law and uh, justice will be served. Um, information like uh, again, Kranma mentioned earlier, I think that uh, on the, when, when, when the, the institution or the, the leaders or the, the government come in to try to block us from voicing our issues, from sharing it, our, our problems or the different human rights violations that is taking place in our communities, like the case where I gave about 13 radio stations were closed, I think we should, we should not just sit back and look, we should, we should push back. Uh, like I said earlier, these, most of these radio stations didn't, didn't close, actually didn't uh, chase the stuff that they were asked to chase. They, they pushed on, they continued sharing the information with the public. So I think we should also continue sharing because it's through sharing this information that I know that, oh, this thing is happening in this place. What can be done about it? It's that the world gets to know the different violations that is taking place. But also not uh, to, to add on that, I think we should uh, do more sensitization we should do more advocacy in the community, the rural grassroots, mostly uh, so that the people at the grassroots can be able to know that different human rights and some of the different pathways they can follow in case their rights have been violated, what they can do. Because oftentimes people are violated, uh, their rights are infringed, but they don't even know where to start. They don't know what to do. So they just sit back and they just watch. So I, I add civil servants, I add, add different advocates, different act, activists, and even the government to, to come in and continue at, uh, and continue uh, sensitizing the masses, sensitizing the community, particularly uh, the women about, you know, uh, the women's rights and uh, what you can do as a woman if you're being violated, what are the different pathways you can take, and what you can do uh, in and case see. certain things are not done. Uh, yes, Fancy, my time is up. Hello, Fancy. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lucy, for that. So we have come to the end of our community talk show for today. And I would like to get closing statements from all our panelists. Uh, I will start with Adelaide. Thank you, Fancy. They are not going to be given to us by anyone. And most importantly, we, may, we must seek to know what these our rights are. The moment we know these rights, then we can stand against any violations. 
because we are informed. We must seek out to have knowledge all the time. Because the moment you do not have the knowledge, those that have the knowledge will oppress you. So how do we stand against these oppressions, against these violations? We must seek to know, we must seek to learn, we must equip ourselves with the knowledge that we need. And finally, we call upon the government, the state institutions, that it's never too late. Even as sinners, when you have sinned, you always have a chance to confess in the Christian faith. So there is still room for them to confess their sins and to get back on track. It's never too late. Otherwise, together, we can be better and divided we fall. So we still need to stand together. We are all Ugandans. Those that work for these state institutions, those that are in the opposition, this country needs all of us. This country needs every individual Ugandan for us to build the country together. I thank you. Yes, Kranma, it's time for you to give us your closing remark. Thank you, Madam Fancy. Uh, like I said, we do, not, uh, we do not have to wait to be the victims of the circumstances. If we can raise up like right now, it's not too late to have a changed country. It's not too late to have a better society. It's, no, it's not too late to have uh, polished leaders. It's not too late to have <clears throat> informed citizens. But uh, the onus is on us to know when, how, and where to begin from. If we can uh, be timely and we start as early as now because we are as late as yesterday, we would be good to go. And uh, to those, our police officers that are too cruel and aggressive while they're arresting their fellow citizens. The only word I can leave with them is that they should mind about their life after uniform. They are now in the uniform, but they have a life to live after the uniform. And to our judicial services, yes, they, they are our judges, we believe in their wisdom and we know that with them, we can have a better society. So if they can do what they are supposed to do, when they are supposed to do it, and with whom they are supposed to do it with, without being biased and without having that mind for money too much, we shall be a better Uganda. Like I said earlier, whenever I read our motto, Forgotten My Country, I know that not all hope is gone yet. We still believe that God can redeem this country for a better today, tomorrow and the days to come. I thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Kranma. Uh, let's move to Lucy and uh, get your closing remark. Yes, Lucy, it's time for you to give us your closing uh, remark. Thank you so much, Fancy. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, lastly, what I just want to say is that uh, silence in the face of injustice is also injustice in itself. So let us speak up, let us act now, let us do something now. Because the more we keep procrastinating, we keep having conversations, we keep having meetings, we keep have, having, you know, talking without acting, we are not going to move forward. So let's act now, let's do something. You never know how far that small act will go. You never know how far that action taking and sharing. Uh, with the, 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 the people who can act on, who can help, who can support and go. It can really go a long way. So let's act up now and uh, do better. Thank you.
Okay, um, thank you so much, uh, Lucy. And uh, we have come to the end of our talk show for today. I would like to extend my gratitude to Center for Constitutional Governance and Civic Space TV for organizing this community talk show, which is very, very fruitful. And I hope that somebody out there has been from it. I hope the stakeholders have been able to listen in and will be able to act upon the different discussions that we have had today. So thank you so much, CCG and Civic Space TV. I would like to extend my gratitude to the panelists who were with us today to discuss with us this topic. Uh, today we had a panel of three. We had a here is a Kranma, Uganda Red Cross Society. Thank you, Kranma. We also had Adelaide Nachitende, who is a computer scientist and youth leader in DP and an activist as well. Thank you so much, uh, Adelaide, for being with us. And last but not least, we had uh, Akun Lucy Okwera, who is a human rights activist in Pade District. Thank you so much, our panelists, for being with us. Our topic for today was State of Human Rights in Uganda. I've been your moderator for today. My name is Dr. KJ Nafasi, and thank you so much our viewers for watching. And uh, this is the end of the show. See you again next time. That is next week, same time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.